My name is Louis Bel de Vroe, and this is an English episode of the Club Groeneveld podcast, Back to Nature, where I have conversations with inspiring people about the art of being human, how to live a meaningful life, and the search for our place in the world. Our hope is that anyone who listens to these conversations will be inspired to look inside themselves and maybe ask questions about their own humanity and their own place on this miraculous world. Questions we too often forget to ask ourselves. In this episode, I have a conversation with Satish Kumar. Satish was born in India in 1936 and is a long-term peace and environment activist and pacifist. Inspired in his early 20s by Bertrand Russell, Satish embarked on an 8,000-mile peace pilgrimage from New Delhi to Moscow, Paris, London and Washington, D.C., the capitals of the world's earliest nuclear-armed countries. Now living in England, Satish is founder of the Schumacher College International Center for Ecological Studies and was a longtime editor of Resurgence and Ecologist magazine and is the author of many books, including his autobiography, No Destination. He continues to teach and run workshops on reverential ecology, holistic education and voluntary simplicity. In our conversation, Satish talks about how we are connected through diversity, how every action should be an act of love, how freeing oneself from fear is the greatest freedom there is, about the true nature of pilgrimage, about the life lessons he learned from Bertrand Russell and Martin Luther King, and the most inspiring teacher of all, nature. Okay, well... Um, let's let's then uh, okay well, well perfect I'm I'm just so glad I'm just so very and, and honored as well that uh, again you are giving your time uh, to us to Club Bunefeld and to to me uh, to share with you uh, to share with with us uh, well whoever whatever comes up and um, yeah no it's my pleasure it's great. pleasure yeah. perfect. no problem okay well then and this is uh, this might be uh, irregular but it feels uh, as I said before it's it's Almost, it's a crazy uh, world in which uh, normally it's called uh, Back to Nature, this podcast. And I ask the guest to pick a spot that's dear to him in nature and we walk together. And yeah. and you are, I guess, the first real pilgrim I've ever had on my podcast. And now we're sitting down in different yeah. countries. Um, so my first question would be, could you maybe help us come together and land in the same place? So. Uh, in a way that I feel that meditation could work. And we had a session together in which you beautifully explained how in the meditation that you uh, explained that in, in that, in that, on that day was for me also a way of coming together. So yeah. could you maybe, you know, help us get together in a way? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we, well, even when we are physically distant in our hearts, in our minds, in our consciousness, we can be very close together. And so when meeting of minds, meeting of hearts, and meeting of consciousness, this is where, in a way, kind of pilgrims meet. So, uh, so even though you and I are sitting quite a distant places, you are in Netherlands, I'm in England, but our consciousness and your, our hearts and our minds are very close to each other. So we are, in a way, intimate. And that intimacy is an intimacy of the heart. And, and from the heart comes um, uh, connection and relationship, friendship, uh, love. All those things come from the heart. Uh, feelings, emotions. And so uh, we are close together. And, and we are one heart. <laughs> and 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 then the next question would be um so what we what what I you know we think with the mind all the time so the mind has all these conceptions of what you're saying and then at the same time for the mind that doesn't make sense but for the heart it's very it can be it can be very true so i guess yeah. the next step would be how to live from the heart and not not through the mind Yes. So, uh, in the, in addition to thinking, we need to feel. Actually, we should begin with the feeling, and then maybe 
feeling can lead to thinking. But when you feel at ease within yourself and you feel at ease with each other in relationship and we are not judging, but we are accepting each other as each other are. So acceptance is the quality of the heart and, and separation, judgment, expectation, analysis, those are the qualities of the brain. And so at the moment, we are not judging. We are not expecting, we are not analyzing, we are just feeling together mm. and, and accepting each other as we are and without any judgment or expectation. So we have to drop expectations and live in acceptance. And after you accept, then you participate in conversation, in dialogue. And through participation, we learn, we transform. We change, we evolve, uh, uh, we, we um, move forward. So that is a, a process of participation. And the participation comes through whole body. Uh, our minds, our hearts, our hands, our body, our eyes, our words, everything comes together in order to participate. So thinking, feeling, and participating. So acceptance is the key. At the moment in our modern world, we don't accept things. We always judge and we criticize and we say, this is good, that is bad. I don't accept this. I don't accept that. I don't like you. Uh, you should be like this. You should do that. You should think like that. We are all the time expecting other people to behave the way I want other people to behave. So we have to shift from there and we say, I accept you as you are, and I love you as you are, not as I want you to be. Because mm. then that's not love. That's a kind of expectation and imposition. So accepting other people as they are and loving them as they are, that is the attitude of the pilgrim. Pilgrim accepts. A tourist expects. So there's a difference between a tourist and a pilgrim. So we are pilgrims of the earth, earth pilgrims. And we accept the earth and we accept people, we accept nature as it is. And then we participate. We grow food, uh, we walk on, uh, on the path, we walk in nature, we walk in the forest, we swim in this water. Um, so we participate in life. With acceptance, we participate. And through participation, we change and others change. Mm. Yeah. That's the attitude of pilgrim. <laughs> and, and I guess what, what acceptance also, for me, the word that comes up is openness, is, is a way to open up um, and to let people in and to let yes. their experiences in. Uh, and yeah. we're so... So when we open up, our hearts are open. The, the door of the house may be closed, but the doors of heart are always open. Mm. And so kind of doors of perception are open. Mm. The, the perception and heart come together. And so when you have a doors of heart open, then you are not narrow. You are not thinking, I'm a European, you are African, you are Asian, I'm American, you are Chinese, I'm a Hindu, you are a Muslim, I'm a Christian, you are a Jew, um, I'm a capitalist, you are a communist. Um, all these kind of divisions and differences end because our heart is open. So we let the heart flow and other people flow and their ideas come into our heart. So our heart gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and we embrace the entire cosmos, and we become a cosmic consciousness. And we, our minds are so big as well. When a heart expands and open, our minds are also open. And then that becomes the mind of God. Um, mind of God is not something separate from us. Um, the moment you include everything, the inclusivity is the mind of God, Inclusive is the opening of the heart. So include everything, exclude nothing. Because we are made of everything. We are made of the sun, the moon, the rain, uh, the, the earth, the soil, um, our ancestors, our parents, earth, air, fire, water, consciousness. Everything is made. So we are made of the cosmic forces. And so uh, we are cosmic beings. See, uh, cosmos is our home. Um, uh, cosmos is our country and, but we are rooted in a place like wh where you are you, your feet are there so you are 
local as well as universal and cosmic. So our body is in a way, our feet are rooted in the soil and we garden there, we cook food there, and we have a friends there, we have parents, we have, a, we have the children, we have family. Uh, so there's a rootedness, local uh, community. But our minds and hearts are cosmic and universal. So the values are universal, the spirit is universal. So with this combination of universal and local, mm. in that open heart acceptance works. And it also opens, well, it opens up a lot of questions, but uh, one of the, the things that it reminds me immediately of that, that there's uh, diversity, uh, but in diversity, there's also a universal ground. So uh, everyone is different, but it also they're connected in a deeper sense. And the more we can also celebrate diversity, um, we find that everyone can find his own way in life uh, within the bigger scheme of life. Because it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean diversity doesn't mean that everyone is, is disconnected at all, I think. No, no. Through diversity, we are connected. Mm. Because we all come from the single source. The origin of the entire cosmos is Brahman in Sanskrit, uh, Big Bang in scientific language, uh, evolution. So at the beginning of time, Brahma or the Big Bang is one. There's no ocean, there's no mountains, there are no animals, there are no forests, there are no humans. Um, just the Brahman is the kind of um, openness, open heart, open mind of divine presence, Big Bang. Then evolution works hard to create diversity. So evolution favors diversity. So slowly, slowly, gradually, from a scientific universe story, we have become mil uh, trillions of life forms um, and insects and, and animals and birds and forests and mountains and humans. And within humans, seven billion people are all different. Each and every human being is unique and special. So that uniqueness and speciality and, and a, and a um, particularity comes from the unity. So, so my mother and father and my ancestors made me who I am. So I carry uh, the spirit and even the physical genes and the cells uh, of my parents and my grandparents and my ancestors for, mil for millions of years. I'm carrying them. So I am a continuing continuation. And then my children and great-grandchildren will continue with my genes and my spirit and my consciousness and my love. And so this is a continuum. So unity and diversity dance together. Mm. Yeah. And it's, and it's such an awe-inspiring feeling when you can truly, when you, what you're talking about, when you can truly open your heart and, and, and see through or feel through uh, the, the boundaries of the mind that we think that everything is disconnected. But when you can truly open up to someone else and really meet someone, uh, then, then you know the magic happens. Then, then there's this uh, recognition between between whatever you see. It can be a can be a person, it can be a mountain, it can be water, it can be anything. Yeah, yeah. So the old science uh, and old philosophy, like Rene Descartes, uh, the French philosopher, and and Newton and uh, Francis Bacon, all these uh, scientists um, separated. And the mind and matter separate, body and mind separate, uh, nature and human separate, um, a country separate, uh, religion separate. So this dualism and separation has created conflict and created tension and, and leads to war, leads to exploitation, uh, leads to exploitation of women, exploitation of black, exploitation of peasants, exploitation of farmers, exploitation of cheap labor. So these are all caused by this dualism, separation, disconnection. And that has been in the philosophy of, um, we can say mostly Western philosophy, uh, Cartesian philosophy in France, but also in other places, um, uh, uh, mechanistic thinking and seeing that nature is a machine, uh, earth is a machine, it's a dead rock, and, and, and people are separate, there's no connection. So this has led to so many conflicts and wars and tensions and creates more anger and more fear and more mistrust 
among people. So when we shift from that uh, consciousness to a consciousness of unity and diversity dancing together, then we say, yes, this is diversity to be celebrated, but we are beyond this diversity, there's a unity. We all come from the same uh, origin and same source, and we all share same consciousness, and we share earth, air, fire, water, these uh, physical uh, elements, and also we share uh, the non-physical elements of spirit and consciousness. If we can have that understanding of unity of life, non-duality, and then we can celebrate diversity. Right. So, and, and then it, it's, all, it's all about, you know, it's inside in, in the self in, uh, of the mind. It, it, from this inside, you can, you can experience that, that it's actually true that the mind separates, but that there's a unity that's, that's larger than the mind. Um, Absolutely. And um, I would love just to touch on, upon a, uh, on a few steps along your incredible way that, it, that you've walked and that you've walked through life and your journey that, that really touched me in reading your autobiography, uh, No Destination. And um, one of the things, and that you, you touched upon it as well, because uh, it's, it's what you're talking about in, in your book and in your life, I guess, is, is not only about conceptual thinking or even more about, about the living of the heart and in love, but also in how to act out, uh, in, in the words of, 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 the, of Gandhi, of course, in his spirit, uh, uh, be the change you want to see in the world. Um, there were many, many teachers along the way that, you, that you've met. And one of the uh, teachers, I think, his name was Vinobi. Vinoba. Vinoba, sorry. Yeah, Vinoba. And, um, and one passage in your book just uh, it stood out for me. When, he, when you were with him, I guess, uh, working on the, uh, how to give the land back, to, uh, to, to the lower castes, um, he talked about you were confronting the landowners and you were trying to get them to have the inside of, of having them share their, the, 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 the lands. Um, and some of them were very, you know, were tough and very, very tough-minded. And then he, he said something along the lines of, uh, see, you must, you must look at every person as a, as a castle or as a house or as a wall. And then in every wall, there's a little entrance. Yeah. Could you, could you maybe tell a little bit about that? Because for me, that was, that was such a uh, loving and compassionate way of looking at, you know, people who are not in uh, agreement with you. Yeah. What Vinoba was saying, that we have to bring about change in society by changing the hearts, change of hearts is prerequisite, pre is essential if you want to change politics, economics, social systems. If we don't change the heart and you change just the system, it won't last very long and that system will become corrupt again. Now, how do you change the heart? Well, everybody has their own thinking, their own conditioning, their own um, um, way, of, uh, way of perception. So, um, so you have to Find the key to the heart. So that's where he was giving that example. That if you are wanting to enter into a palace, now palace has a big walls all around, but there are one or two doors to that big um, kind of parameter of a palace or a fort. And so you have to go along the wall, touching the wall, and keep walking, keep walking, keep walking with patience and with waiting until you come to a door and you feel the door and you say, yes, this is the door. And then you look at that lock and there's a lock. And then you have to say, who has the key? Maybe somebody, there's a somebody who's a doorkeeper or the key keeper. And so you find that person and you get the key. And when you open the door and open the key, then you can enter the big palace which had many beautiful rooms and beautiful furniture and a great garden and all the things are in the palace. But you have to find the door into the heart of that palace. So in the same way, every human heart is a palace. And, but people have put some barriers. They have locked their hearts. And because they want to protect themselves, they, protect, they want to protect their wealth, they want to protect their ideas, they want to protect their prejudices, they want to protect their philosophy, they want to protect their religion, whatever it is that they feel possessive. Say, I don't want um, somebody to change me and change my mind. 
But then you, when you enter the heart, then you can, uh, then you can appeal to that person's heart and you can communicate and you can be friendly and not a threat. You don't make them feel threatened. So this is a kind of action of love. So Vinoba was saying that every action should be an act of love. And you are, you are not trying to change the world as a kind as if I know better than you. Uh, you are not good. You are wrong. I am right. Um, uh, I am good. You are bad. And therefore, I want to change you. That is not the loving attitude. Your attitude should be an attitude of friend. So you come with love, friendship and love. And you come that we will explore together how we can change together. Because I and you are not separate. So your change and my change go together. And so it's a kind of mutuality. It's a kind of reciprocity. It's a kind of togetherness. And that is the action of love. So if you go with that love and gratitude and humility, because if we say you are right, wrong, I'm right, you are going through arrogance. Because you know I'm right. Your religion is wrong. My religion is right. Your country is wrong. My country is right. Your politics is wrong, my politics is right. Your economic system is wrong, my economic system is better. This is a kind of dualism, separation and arrogance. So when you go with humility, then it's a heart opening. And, and humility is the key to the heart. So the key is a metaphor. The lock is a metaphor. So the key to everybody's heart is humility. So you go with humble attitude, without arrogance, without ego, and say, uh, how can I be your servant? How can I be your friend? How can we work together? Uh, so if you have that attitude, then you can be effective. And this is how all the great teachers have worked. The Buddha uh, worked like that, like a friend, uh, without arrogance. Lao Tzu in China, uh, Jesus Christ, um, uh, all the great teachers, St. Francis, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, if you take all the great examples of people who have been uh, social reformers and transformers, they have all practiced humility. They did not use any weapons. They did not use any violence. They did not have any political power. They did not have any prisons. They did not have any legal power. Uh, they had, did not have any financial power, but they had a power of love and humility. So Vinoba's idea was that the key to every human heart is humility. And you have to find that key within you and then you can open everybody's heart and you can enter. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, it's, and when, you're, when, you're, when you're speaking of this, it's, um, and we discussed this earlier, but um, uh, it's a, it's a, when I look at the political landscape and when I look yeah. at political leaders, there's such a huge gap not even in what the way they're acting, which obviously there is because it's more their they all have their palaces, but they're guarding it and they're attacking each other's palaces. Uh, they're not really trying to find an entrance. But even more so, the vocabulary that, that, that is just is so different. It, it seems like the vocabulary of love, the vocabulary of, of, of you know, being human, uh, of our true uh, feelings, and, and, and it, it, has, it has no, it seems like it has almost no place in politics. It feels like politics has been has been complete, everything that that's maybe uh, uh, has a sprinkle of humanity in it has been, isn't allowed. It feels like it isn't allowed in that space. And that for me is, it, it, that's why it's become so mechanical. There's no, yeah. you, it's difficult to connect to, polit, to, to the political language. And, and how, how, is it possible, do you think, to, to find uh, a connection between the, the language you use, the, the language of love maybe, uh, or the, 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 the language of, of, of hum humanity, is it possible to incorporate it in politics? Because also the, the leaders that you're talking about, they have all, they've never entered, or not many have entered politics. Yes, the two things. One is our political system, so-called democratic system, mm. is a system of opposition. <clears throat> so you have government and you have party of opposition. And the opposition is a part of the government. It's a kind of, in England, we call it Her Majesty's opposition. Mm -hmm. So it's a government's opposition. And whatever government does, the work of opposition is to oppose and criticize and scrutinize. So this is a kind of dualistic 
and, and a kind of oppositional political system. We need to come to a more consensual politics. In consensual politics, uh, all members of parliament work together and say we need to find a consensus where um, uh, without party politics, without separation, without division, we discuss and see what is best for the country. And everybody is thinking not best for my party or best for my um, uh, particular section uh, of, uh, of politics, but for the whole country, for the whole people, and not only country, but the whole Europe and the whole world. Um, what is good for the planet Earth? That kind of thinking uh, has to come. So this was in a way, um, it's, it's not easy because our politics is so entrenched and we believe in this opposition and we believe in this uh, judgmental politics and all the media is also always looking bad things. G good news is not news. Only bad news is news. And so uh, whatever government does, the media and the opposition party will always look what is wrong in it? What is a hole in it? What is a what is this where we can criticize? How can we present it negatively? This kind of attitude leads to conflict and leads to division and not celebration of diversity. And therefore, we have to go a long way. This is very not easy. All over the world, this so-called democratic system is a system of uh, division and separation. We need to find a way of consensual uh, politics where people work together for the better, for not for their ego, not for their power, not for their prestige and, and a position. I'm prime minister and you are nothing. But we are, we are all together in this work and we are in the service of humanity, in the service of the planet Earth. That's a very different kind of politics. And I don't know where we, how we start with it. Hmm. Maybe we can hope that, like in Switzerland, there is a much more... Uh, decentralized politics. You never know who is the prime minister. You never know in Switzerland who is the president. It's all Canton make a lot of decisions locally. And so decentralized system. So that could be a good model, uh, the Swiss model, where power is decentralized. Economics are also decentralized. More local power, local economy, uh, local um, needs, and people looking after each other at a local level. So that you don't have so much central power in Brussels or in uh, in um, uh, in the Hague, ha Hague, or in London or Moscow or or Washington or New Delhi or Beijing or Tokyo or the big big centers of power. They should be decentralized. So that's the ideal, Gandhian ideal, uh, that we have a, a power in the hands of people rather than power in the hands of political parties. And 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 so if we can develop that like a Swiss model, I would say, uh, that will be good. But at the moment, even in Holland, which is a small country, you have quite a lot of opposition and quite a lot of conflict. Uh, and people never uh, come to a consensual um, decision that what is good for the whole country and not for the party. That's a big question. Yeah. And, and, and I guess, uh, absolutely. And... Um and I think the the theme of decentralizing and uh, is something I will I will uh, come back later to because I, I think it also has to do with Schumacher and 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 in your in your traveling and in your life there are many places you touched. Uh, but before I'll ask about that because I'm very curious. Um, just two more things that I'm just now that I that I'm speaking with you. There are two more persons that you met. Uh, one was Bertrand Russell who inspired you uh, in the first place to to set yeah. up on a journey. And, and then in England, obviously. Uh, and, and after that, you, you also met Martin Luther King. Yeah. Um, could, you, could you just, <laughs> out of pure curiosity, uh, because you write about him in the book that he made a, a, a huge impression on you, both these extraordinary persons. Um, what, what, what part of their humanity, what part of what, what they were doing, what touched you? What was, the, what was it? What touched me about Bertrand Russell was that at age 90, he was fearless and he was prepared to go to prison for peace in the world, for nuclear disarmament. And he was, even though he was 90 years old and he knew that in a few years he will be gone, why should he worry? Uh, he should um, be retired and he should relax and enjoy his life, but no, 
fearlessness and his commitment and dedication for the well-being of humanity and his uh, his commitment that it's not just me my generation i have to make sure the future generations the coming generations are looked after and their well-being and their uh, good society and good life is secured and maintained and therefore somebody like bertrand russell thinking about the future generations this was a very impressive because most people think of themselves or their children maybe their family but they don't think about the generate future generations to come so this kind of old man of 90 years going to jail and 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 thinking about the future generations and thinking about peace in the world that was so inspiring and he was a mathematician uh, he was a nobel prize winning um, uh, philosopher um, uh, he was a lord russell he had a good prestige he came from a very aristocratic family and yet he was prepared to take a uh, hardship upon his life and go to jail to make a point that we cannot afford to have nuclear weapons in the world and we cannot afford to have wars in the world we have to create a world of peace and, and disarmament and so that was so inspiring and so that i when i was only 26 years old when i heard about him and read about him i said he is a man of 90 going to jail for peace in the world what am i doing a young man of 26 sitting here in a coffee house drinking coffee um so um, at age 90 he was a man of young heart and, and i at age 26 was doing something like a, a age 90 uh, old old heart and old man so i wanted to change that i wanted to become a young uh, of my age and i wanted this is why i decided inspired by bertrand russell i decided to walk for peace in the world from new delhi india to moscow and to paris and to london and to washington dc to protest against the nuclear weapons in support of bertrand russell and joining the movement for bertrand russell so so man of that age of that caliber and that talent and that intelligence and that wisdom and having that courage courage was the key uh, the fearlessness was the key that was the most inspiring most people are full of fear they don't want to bring any discomfort to themselves they, they are too worried about anything going wrong but bertrand russell was completely free of fear and the freedom from fear is the greatest freedom if you can have freedom from fear then there's nothing in the world that you cannot do everything we stops us doing because we are too afraid we are too afraid to take any risk but bertrand russell was prepared to take a risk in his life of every kind so what i learned from bertrand russell the greatest lesson of my life is freedom from fear yeah. and it's, it's and then then martin luther king hmm. that was another great example um when in august 1963 he marched to washington and made a great speech i have a dream when black and white people can walk together as brothers and sisters i have a dream when white people are not exploiting the black and discarding them and keeping them separate from their schools and and their uh, restaurants and their hospitals this kind of uh, segregation will end i have a dream and that dream was completely based in non violence and love so i was uh, so inspired by that speech so when i arrived in uh, america i wrote to him and i said that you have a great dream but i have a small dream and my dream is to meet you and be inspired by you and he was so humble and so kind and and so prompt that he immediately answered my letter and said yes come see and see me i'm very inspired by mahatma gandhi and i'm inspired to hear your story that you have walked all the way from india to america without money on your two legs two feet and therefore i'm very inspired by your story so come and see me and tell me your story he was so humble and so i went to see him and he was sitting um, uh, in his uh, um, office and there was a, a mahatma gandhi's picture on the on his back or behind him on the wall and and um, he said what i learned from mahatma gandhi is that non violence is not only a way of protesting against injustice non violence is not merely a way of resistance non violence is a way of life and 
We have to be the embodiment of nonviolence. And nonviolence is not physical nonviolence, but even nonviolence of speech, nonviolence of thoughts. Even if we have a violent thoughts and violent speech, that is damaging. And also, fear is violence. Anger is violence. Greed is violence. So his idea of, of Martin Luther King's idea of nonviolence was all embracing. It was a kind of uh, a, a spiritual philosophy of love in a way. So love is a positive word. Nonviolence is a negative word. Do no harm to yourself. Do no harm to others. Do no harm to nature. So all together as a way of life. So that was very inspiring. Uh, 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 beautiful. And, and, and uh, again, I guess it's, it's if you want a peaceful world, it, it should really start with, with yourself. It's, Absolutely. It's impossible to, to create a peaceful world if there's, if there's an inherent violence in, inside of you, yourself. And I guess most people, and I think this is very important as well, most people uh, know this. Mo most people experience inner violence. There, there's a lot of self-hate. There's a lot of fear to overcome. Um, so when talking about change, I guess, um, it really starts with, 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 with yourself. And in my own experience, it has helped. It's the only way in which I can, you know, go forward is by being very vigilant in, in my own practice to, to find a way to open the heart. But this is not something that, that's, that you can create by your, with your mind. It, 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 it needs practice. It, it needs, well, it needs people like you as well and people like Martin Luther King who can show you like there's a way of love. That's right, absolutely. Because the self is the friend of the self. Self is the enemy of the self. We can be contented within ourselves. We can be enlightened within ourselves. We have a total control on ourselves. We cannot control others. We, we, we cannot change others, actually. We can change ourselves. And others will change themselves. We can communicate. We can be an example. We can be inspiration. Martin Luther King was an inspiration. Uh, and Bertrand Russell was an inspiration. Mahatma Gandhi was an inspiration. But everybody has to change from their own heart, from within. That's a true change. That's a change of heart, the real change. So self is the friend of the self. And so we have to uh, change ourselves, work on ourselves. We have control. We are the CEO of our own lives. We are not CEO of somebody else's lives. So we can communicate, we can inspire, we can help, but we cannot impose our ideas and change our uh, thinking and change other people. We have to change ourselves and be an example for others. We have to be radiators to radiate change so that others may be warm with our our want, but we cannot impose our ideas on other people. That's not freedom. Freedom must come from within. And each and every person has to take responsibility for themselves and their own change and their own transformation. So it's, we are all on a journey of transformation. We are all on a journey of life. And that journey, we have to make ourselves. Nobody else can make journey for us. We have to make, everybody has to make their own journey. And that is the true the nature of pilgrimage, and, and I and I I love the expression of um, how to find your own journey is to really be, you know, to be to to have attention on your own experiences and to I like the expression to follow the thread. There's this thread if you really pay attention to your own life and you start seeing it. Mostly in my life, when I got older than thirty years old, I could see themes coming up and I could see you know the points in life where I got a lot of energy and stuff that were weren't giving me energy. And it takes, it takes a little bit of courage, actually, to say no to the stuff that doesn't give you energy because oftentimes the outside world will put up on you and say, no, but you should do that. However, your inner compass shows, shows the way. It, it, needs some, you know, it, it needs some attention. But if Absolutely. You, and, then, and then you will find uh, it's possible to find this, this journey. And um, uh, being mindful of your time, there, there are two more themes I would like to touch upon, if that's okay with okay. you. Okay. Um, one is, is uh, it seems like a paradox, but it's just, it, it keeps coming up in your, in, your, in your book. It's also called No Destination. However, um, in your book, there are many destinations you reach which have a special meaning to you, which, where you resonate. One of the, let me just look it up because I, I just, yeah, one of the, I'll just, can I read just one because it really touched me. 
how place can be something that that well it can be it can resonate with with your own being and one of the places you were was Benares or Benares yes yeah. Benares Benares and and, and, you, and you write Benares was a mysterious city the more i lived in it the more i liked it it was a city where nobody hurried i lived in a house in a narrow alley where only pedestrians and cows were able to wander in this old city i i felt all around me a sense of timelessness life seemed as if it might have been a thousand years ago and and this touched me because it, it also reminded me maybe as a blueprint or or a seed for schumacher it reminded me of a couple of places of a stupa i was in myanmar where there was silence and and and, and nothingness or stillness a home of great stillness and yeah. um, um i was i was looking at your life there i was wondering about the seeming paradox between moving like a river and flowing like a river and 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 always being at home in your journey uh, and also finding the very big need uh, as every person feels at, at creating a place that's for you a home yeah and how how do these relate in your opinion in your life <coughs> no it is a paradox but there is a a kind of you can say that in your mind in your consciousness you are not attached with anything you have a sense of detachment so you can flow like a river without being attached to any one place like a tree grows into the sky is not attached to the soil and yet it is rooted in the soil and also the river is also rooted in the soil between the two banks from the source to uh, the, uh, the sea always there all the great rivers are there all the time so they are flowing and they are there at the same time river is at home uh, in uh, its own place and yet is flowing to the sea and and all the time new water is coming in but the river remains within the two banks in that one particular place forever for thousands of years and so uh, so there is no contradiction between being rooted and being flowing so i am rooted in myself and I, even now i have lived in um in of course in balanasi in banaras i lived uh, for a long time and that was a great sense of place and and a sacred space uh, it's a very uh, kind of beautiful place uh, where the river ganges flows and so i was all the time going and swimming in the ganges or going over boat on the ganges and so um and there were beautiful temples there and and lots of flowers and lots of um farms and lots of good food and lots of beautiful mangoes and so i had a tremendous sense of place and sense of love and rootedness in in banaras but also now i'm in england and i have lived here for 40 years and have a garden and i have two acres and i have 15 uh, apple trees and i i i make juice with apple juice i make and so all these uh, being rooted in a place and yet in your mind in your heart in your consciousness in your ideas you are not stuck you are not attached you are free in your heart and free in your spirit and free in your mind and consciousness so freedom and being rootedness are not contradictory they have a, they have a paradox but not a contradiction and you can be both you can flow and be like a flower in in the pond a water lily or a lotus is in the water but not off the water it never drowns in the water it's a root in the water but if the water rises it also rises and this way you can remain detached and remain flowing and yet you can be loving and rooted in your place and then and then for for the just to build the bridge and and you've touched upon it as well is uh is the the importance of nature in your work and in your life and and how you know it's a teacher and um um i was just wondering this is usually my first question because usually as i as i explained we normally are in the same place and and it's a place the guest picked so now i'm curious uh if i were uh, if i were to to be in in england and you could pick any or oh no not, let's say not even england you could pick any place to to walk with me and to have a conversation what 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 place would you pick and why i will pick dartmoor 
Dartmoor is in Devon, uh, in England, and the, and the Dart River comes from Dartmoor. And, and Dartmoor is very wild, and it has some, some spots, very beautiful um, river valley, uh, the Dart Valley, and also very beautiful uh, wood, woods, oak woods, and surrounded by rocks. And so uh, whenever there is a moment, particularly with Schumacher College students, I take them to Dartmoor and I walk on the wild and uh, hilly. So we go up and up and up and on the uh, kind of rocks, uh, the uh, mounds of rocks. And, and so valleys, rocks, woodland, uh, river, valley, uh, and, and the hills, all landscapes are there. And so for me, nature becomes my pilgrimage. Nature becomes my church or cathedral or temple or mosque. When I go and lie down under the tree on the Dartmoor in this wild place, all my anxiety and fear and anger and worry disappear. I can, even my despondency, even my kind of despair about the world and all the problems of the world, like climate change and coronavirus and, and all the kind of problems that the world faces today, for that moment, I am free. So lying on the, on the rocks or under the tree or on the grass on Dartmoor in the wild place, that's my home. That's my religion. That's my temple. That's my meditation. Uh, my mantra is Dartmoor. The moment I think of Dartmoor, I'm at home in the wild. So I embrace the wilderness of Dartmoor. So nature is my true um, religion. Nature is, for me, God is not somewhere away behind the clouds uh, controlling the world. God is in nature. Nature uh, and God are one. And so that sacred nature, the divine nature, is what most and that keeps me alive. And whenever I need some nourishment, I go in nature. My soul is nourished. My spirit is nourished. My mind is nourished. My body is nourished. I feel full of inspiration. Even, I mean, I was inspired by Vinoba, by Bertrand Russell, by Mahatma Gandhi, by Martin Luther King, by John Byers, by Mother Teresa. But these are the human, uh, human inspirations. But even greater inspiration for me are trees and Dartmoor and, and the mountains. I walked on Mount Kailash in Himalayas. Those are the other inspirations for me in my life. It, it, it reminds me, for, for me, more and more nature becoming a, a, a sacred place almost. Because it, for, what I re, when you say nature is my religion, uh, I think and a lot of what you're saying and, and of the examples and the inspiration uh, you, 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 you talk about, they are, judge, they are not judging, so they're open. And nature, I guess, shows us there's nothing in nature with a mask on. There's only true nature. And it exactly. doesn't judge you. It doesn't, it doesn't think of you anything. And it actually, in, in that way, is an example of a, of a no dogmatic or undogmatic world in which we actually live. We have created dogmas, and it, it, it reminds me that you know that's the place. It's such a great, it's such a great inspiration to to really feel uh, unjudged, and it's a yeah. it's a beautiful place to be in because even in our mind we are judging ourselves most of the times. Uh, exactly, and and for me that reminds me that what you're saying about nature is actually the people you have the the inspirational people are all people who are like nature in the sense that they are not judging and they're open exactly. and they're saying exactly. they're one. Exactly, exactly. And, and if, if, if you don't mind, uh, I'll, and I'll, I'll finish up, um, but we, we spoke on, the, we, we, we connected on the email as well, and I, I talked a little bit about the stupa uh, I, was, I was seeing, I saw in, in Myanmar, which gave me great stillness. And, and you said this about it, because it reminds me of what we were just talking about. And you say, I've always enjoyed being at a stupa. Uh, maybe for the listeners, a stupa, uh, could, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just uh, it's, yeah, what is it? It's a... Uh, it's it's just it's just stone. It's a sacred symbol. Sacred and it's a stone pillar. It's very simple, and and you say I have always enjoyed being at a stupa. They are symbols of the spirit without a particular image attached to them. The pilgrim can relate to them in their own way according to their own spirit. Therefore, stupas are much more universal symbols. 
and and I think you're really the, the language you speak is the universal language the, you know, the, the, of humanity and of the nature that we we are and um, I, I thank you I thank you very much for for your time and, and for speaking this language with us and um, and maybe before I finish there's this there's this poem of Rumi that keeps coming back to me uh, yeah. I keep I don't know I just have to <laughs> share it with everyone I, I meet and especially with you because it's in in the same well in the same spirit I think yeah. um, yes. I will read it. Could you maybe just af, af, just give us, uh, uh, you know, what it what it means to you, what what you hear, and then yeah. could you join me or or uh, join me in, in in finding a way to in stillness, uh, you know, be together for maybe a, a couple of moments more. Yeah. Okay. Great. It's called um, a community of the spirit. There is a community of the spirit. Join it and feel the delight of walking in the noisy street and being the noise. Drink all your passion and be a disgrace. Close both eyes to see with the other eye. Open your hands if you want to be held. Sit down in this circle. Quit acting like a wolf and feel the shepherd's love filling you. At night, your beloved wanders. Don't accept consolations. Close your mouth against food. Taste the lover's mouth in yours. You moan, she left me. He left me. Twenty more will come. Be empty of worrying. Think of who created thought. Why do you stay in prison when the door is so wide open? Move outside the tangle of fear thinking. Live in silence. Flow down and down in always widening rings of being. Wonderful. It's a very inspiring Rumi poem. And the being is the most important. We have to shift from having to being. And being a lover. That is beautiful. Rumi is asking us to be a lover. Lover of ourselves. Lover of the world lover of people, love, lover of nature, just be a lover. The moment you are a lover, you are your true self. So we end this one with a little bit of uh, mantra, chant. Oh. Shanti. Lead me from death to life, from falsehood to truth. Lead me from despair to hope, from fear to trust. Lead me from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our hearts, our world, our universe. Peace, peace, peace. Oh, Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Thank you. You have been listening to an English episode of Back to Nature, the podcast of Club Groeneveld. With special thanks to Satish Kumar, Elaine Green, Martin Groenendijk, Ivanka Houterman and Marcel Chepkema. Want to know more or join one of our programs? Follow us at Instagram, LinkedIn or Facebook, subscribe to our newsletter or visit us at www.clubgroeneveld.nl.